I am thrilled. Woof, I'm sweating. Good thing I'm an athlete. Um, so our next speaker was Maker's very first interviewee. We made this poor woman sit for four hours. We now do them in one. And um, from that, that moment, I knew we were on to something really special. And um, I really, truly believe Makers would not have happened without the story of Catherine Switzer. Um, she, I've been trying to convince her to come to this conference for six years. She lives in New Zealand in the winter, so she has a good excuse. But she said for the 100th anniversary, she'd be happy to come. Please welcome the unstoppable Catherine Switzer! I love it when you get a standing ovation before your speech. Okay, that's a very, very good sign. You know, there's an expression in a marathon um, that you go through a lifetime of experiences. I often say I started the Boston Marathon as a girl, and I finished the Boston Marathon as a grown woman. We're going to go through a marathon for the next day and a half together. Very, very exciting time. It's an arduous journey. Um, and I think we're going to go through a lifetime of experiences. At least I hope so. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my story. And I'm going to pull some things from it that I think might be good for us this, in the next couple of days. Things that we can discuss, things that um, are really, really important to what we're trying to do. And the story begins, imagine this, a little, because a lot of you are moms. And a little 12-year-old girl comes home from elementary school. She's going to high school, no middle schools in those days, um, the next year, next autumn. Skinny and prepubescent, still playing with dolls. That was me, OK? And I announced at the dinner table to my family that I was going to be a high school cheerleader, because cheerleaders were, going to pre uh, were pretty and popular, and they got to date the captain of the football team. And without missing a beat, my father, big army colonel, very macho, very conservative, said, you don't want to be a cheerleader. Cheerleaders cheer for other people. You want people to cheer for you. The game is on the field. Life, honey, is for participating, not spectating. It was such a concept. Never even thought of it that way. He said, your school has a field hockey team. I don't know what it is. I only know they run, and I know you can run. So why don't you go out? You run a mile a day. If you ran a mile a day, you would make that team and be the best player on it. I went out and started running a mile a day. I thought I never could do it. I sweated through a horrible Washington, D.C. summer. And every day I ran, I knew it was either easy or totally impossible. My first great life lesson. I made the team. I became a good player. But the point is this. It was a mile a day that empowered me for the rest of my life. I had a victory under my belt nobody could take away from me. What a way to go through high school. What a way to go through life. I've been running now for 61 years. 61 years. And I still have that sense of victory under my belt every day that nobody can take away from me. Now, I tell you this story not only to honor my parents, who are amazing, but to tell you that all of you are going to touch the life of a kid in your life. And I want us to make a pledge. This week is going to be about pledges. I want you to make a pledge that you will give them every opportunity to be empowered that there is. Every little attaboy, girl, your own kids, you're going to raise them to be equal, to be respectful, but you're going to give them the opportunity to do it. Every kid on the street deserves an attaboy or an girl. It makes all the difference. If you remember nothing else from what I say today, would you please remember this? And that is that talent and capability is everywhere. It only needs an opportunity. So every kid gets that. But how about you and your direct reports and your team? Give them an opportunity. It's great to watch them show you up. It's amazing. Every time I've given my, my staff an opportunity, they always show me up. But how about yourself? You've got talent and capability, and you may not even know it. Give yourself the opportunity. Create that opportunity. 
Okay, went to Syracuse University. I wanted to be a sports writer because there were no women's sports at Syracuse University, so I thought I'd write about it. Um, and I trained with the men's cross country team, totally unofficially, and that's where I met this guy you saw in the video, Arnie Briggs, ancient guy. He was 50, oh my God. <laughs> I learned more from this guy who was a blue collar mailman who ran every day than I learned from any professor I had at Syracuse University. Never ever underestimate a simple kind heart. They have some of the greatest wisdom in the world. Gloria taught me that about taxi drivers. You learn a lot. Pay attention, all right? When I turned out for the cross country team, the guys were wonderful. This is 1966. The women's liberation movement was highly contentious. I thought they would say I was there to be in their face, and they were wonderful to me. Wow, this was unbelievable. Arnie Briggs was wonderful from every point of view, except from the fact that he didn't believe, as he said, no dame ever ran no marathon. When I told him other women had run marathons, not with any fanfare, he said, if you would run the Boston Marathon, the distance, 26.2 miles, in practice, I'd be the first person to take you to the race. OK, you're on, I said. We went out one day, ran 26.2 miles. I didn't think it was far enough. I said, let's do five more. <laughs> we ran 31 miles, and Arnie passed out at the end of the workout. <laughs> when he came to, he said, women have hidden potential in endurance and stamina. <laughs> let's flash forward now, 53 years later. What are we learning about women's sports? We're never going to be as powerful, as fast, and as strong as men. But we have more endurance, more stamina, more flexibility, more balance. For 3,000 years, sports has been about speed, power, and strength. Women have never even had the opportunity to participate or compete. Now we're finding all that changing. Women are winning 100-mile races, 24-hour runs, mountain travasque climbs, all kinds of things outright, even with the best men endurance runners. We have fat, which is a natural fuel source, OK? Embrace your fat, ladies, OK? All right, so we, we learned that. And um, as, as we're thinking, how is this changing sports, let's flip over to the other way. If we are different in sports but have these attributes, which are now emerging because we have opportunities, what's it going to be like in the workplace? We have other attributes in the workplace, too. We bring a different conversation to debate and to innovation and to creativity. It makes a great team. It isn't about us being better or them being better. It's about us working together and being a great team. Let's give ourselves the opportunity. And if we can't give it to somebody, let's create it, OK? We've got it there. So. Arnie Briggs took me to the Boston Marathon. He made me sign up officially. He said, doesn't count unless you're official. We checked the rule book. There was nothing about gender in the rule book and nothing about gender on the entry form. When I got to the Boston Marathon, I got the same reception from the men in the race. They were wonderful. I wish my wife would run. I wish my girlfriend would run, they'd say. Give me some tips. We're with you all the way. Go for it. I said, this is wonderful. Now. Let's take a step back on this. Earlier, we said, and I'm going to repeat this, we need to bring men into this conversation. Seriously, women and men, we need to bring more men in here. I happen to know thousands of them that I run with who believe in the success of women and want to see us successful. Let's bring them more into this conversation. This is part of being not done. We have to do this. Let's make that pledge, all right? But when the Boston Marathon official, the race director, attacked me in the race, it was one of the worst moments in my life. Absolutely one of the worst moments in my life. It's become one of the best moments in my life, but at the time, it was the worst. Fortunately, I immediately made the decision to finish that race. I knew I had to. If I didn't finish, we were going to be so set back. All of us, all of us have social social prejudice and social disillusionment around us all the time. Every time there's a social injustice that's around you and you walk away from it, you not only have a taste of bitterness in your life, 
but you set us back. We can't solve every social injustice that's around us, but we can do something. And Meryl Lindbergh, in her wonderful book, said, Gift from the Sea, she said, you can't water the entire world if you only have a sprinkling can, but you can do your own garden patch. Let's do that. Make every effort never to walk away from it. Is it hard? It's beyond hard. <laughs> it is relentless. It is relentless. We have women here who can tell you stories of that relentlessness. Gloria is one of them right there. Jody and, and Megan are here too. And they'll tell you about how hard it was to, to pursue this, uh, the Weinstein trial. It's just unbelievably hard, but it has to be done. So we are going to do it because we're very strong. Okay, when I finished the race, when I finished the race, I wanted to be a better athlete, and that was easy, because if you train really hard, you can get better. But I also wanted more than that, to create opportunities for women. I didn't know what it looked like, but I knew opportunity was key. So I dreamed up this idea of creating a series of global races for women only. Give them the opportunity. Make them non-intimidating. Make them competitive up front, but fun for everybody. Everybody said it wouldn't work. I went to a sponsor, Avon Cosmetics. They said it would work. They hired me. We created a series of races, eventually in 27 countries, 400 events for over a million women. I took the data and statistics from those events to the International Olympic Committee, and they had to vote. They had to vote the women's marathon into the Olympic Games in 1984. <laughs> Just just as soon, though, just, you know, for about two months, for about two months, I said, we've leveled the playing field. It's the longest event in the Olympic Games, right? For men or for women, and women are doing it with courage and grace and speed. It was fabulous. But then you look around and you say, oh, my God, we've got so much to do. We've got so much to do. Most of the women in the world live in a fearful situation, not only in 1984, but even worse now. Most of the women in the world live in a fearful situation. However, are we going to reach them? Well, sometimes funny things happen. I often, I never believe in magic, but this is some magic that happened. Let me show you something here. My old bib number from the Boston Marathon. That's where the official tour of the corner office got some use, right? Um, Suddenly, this number started flashing around the world, becoming a number meaning fearless in the face of adversity. Women were wearing it on their backs, men too, for that matter, inking their arms. But when they started sending me their tattoos with my bib number, I had to take it seriously, really. It gave me the creeps, really, you know? Um, <laughs> so from that, we realized that women related to a story about being told you're not good enough, or you're not cool, or you're not welcome, or you're the wrong race, or you're the wrong color, and you don't belong. Have you not been told that? Well, I've been told it a million times. We all have been. And yet you go and you do something, you become fearless, right? These women took one foot in front of the other. They did a couch to a 5K, and they became fearless. They ran a marathon, and they became fearless. So we decided to start a community, um, a series of clubs around the world where they're uh, non-judgmental, where women can come and, and with each other take that first step and become fearless. Sounds simple? It is. It's also easy, cheap, terribly convenient. And now we're in, only two years later in 11 countries. So we'd love you to join us, 261fearless.org. If you think for a moment that we're just talking about getting those women in, in India and, and, and from Mideast out from under their burqas and getting them running. Yeah, sure, they're fearful. But so is the woman who lives next door to you. Think about it. Maybe the woman sitting next to you at this conference, too. Reach out, ladies. Reach out is really, really important. Just to take her by the hand or just chat her up and say, hey, we can do this. We can do this together. All right, two more quick stories. Why am I dressed like this, right? Why am I dressed like this? I'm dressed like this because at age 68, after running, for, and I'm older than that, actually. Um, <laughs> at, age 60, at age 68, after running for 52 years, I got my first paid athlete contract. 
I'm a, I'm a professional jock. I love it. I've always wanted to be a professional athlete and get paid for it. It's absolutely terrific. And I bring that up because I was 68. We're all afraid, and we shouldn't be, of getting old. All right? Sure, keep your health. That is very, very important. But you don't lose your magic. You only gain magic. You don't lose your touch. You only gain it. And wisdom and persistence is forever. You've got that. One of the happiest days, in fact, the happiest day of my life, was April 19th, 2017. And I stood on the starting line of the Boston Marathon again to run it for my 50th anniversary. I could only re recollect how amazing it was that I was alone with only woman wearing a bib number 50 years before. And now we had almost half of the race, 49% was women. And I was surrounded <laughs> by 13,500 women who had qualified and were wearing a bib number in the Boston Marathon. It was the happiest day of my life. That will happen to you too, okay? You will have amazing happy days. I want to wish you that and never be afraid of getting older, but stay in shape too. That's very, very important. <laughs> All right, okay. The last and final story. 2017, I also ran the New York City Marathon. It was 43 years after I won it, so that was a lot of fun. Four days before the race, I think you guys will remember this. A terrorist drove his truck into bicyclists and runners on the West Side Highway and killed people. They said, oh my God, you're gonna, they're gonna have to cancel the marathon. Catherine, you can't run, you can't run. It's dangerous, the terrorists are gonna be there, you can't run. And he said, listen to me. I'm gonna run with 50,000 people on Sunday and almost all of them are total strangers and I would trust every one of them with my life. In the race, the guy next to me is a different color from me and he doesn't speak English. The woman on my right is a gender that is not mine. I don't care. We don't care. We don't care in the marathon who you are, what you look like, what your income is, how old you are. We're there motivating each other. We're pushing each other. We're speaking a language that's universal called running. And at the finish line, we're gonna hug each other, stinking and sweaty and has nothing to do with sex or violence. I just think running <laughs> is a wonderful metaphor for what could be in terms of diversity, inclusion, respect, and equality. If we can do it in running, we can do it anywhere. We can do it anywhere. We're in the middle of this race now. We're not done yet but we're running strong. Stay fearless. Let's have a great week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.